nothing shaped what was to come for our region more than the signing of Treaty 7. Yeah. Uh, what was the impetus for the treaty and what resulted from it? Well, you know, <laughs> one of the biggest things, uh, the, uh, under British law, the, uh, they have a royal proclamation of 1863. The, the king who was in power at the time in Great Britain essentially decreed that uh, land in the colonies yeah. could not just be taken from the indigenous people. It had to be purchased. And so some people characterize the, uh, the, the numbered treaties essentially as land transactions. Now, they were a land transaction between the, the crown the, the represented by the queen, generally Queen Victoria, because a lot of them were signed during her reign, mm -hmm. um, and, and the, uh, uh, the First Nations. Uh, Treaty 7 was put in place in advance of the railway coming here and if you look at the all across Western Canada that was the pattern with the exception uh, of, of Treaty 8 up north which was signed uh, be, uh, in preparation for people actually going up exploring for gold in the, in the Yukon. Okay so essentially the, the Crown's position was you know what we need to free up land for this railroad mm -hmm. or we're and not settlement. Be, and yeah, of course, or nothing's going to expand. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the indigenous people, there was some motivation from, from these well, sure there was. The groups as well. To in looking at Treaty 7 in particular, right, right. the buffalo were gone. Yeah. They were starving. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it, it, uh, you know, uh, Chief Crowfoot actually advised his people not to go to war, don't fight it, mm -hmm. you know, because you're not going to fight this, this big machine that mm -hmm. is the government of Canada, right. and we need to eat. Mm -hmm. So rock and a hard place, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, Did, it, it's a very sad story. It, it, it truly it is. And part part of what we actually display as part of this exhibit. My next question is yeah. a very very poignant uh, little film strip and uh, the, called the Battle of Crowfoot. So you're not mincing mincing words over there. I mean, you're you're telling yeah. the story. Yeah. As yeah. it uh, well as it should be told. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a bit of a warring faction between some of these tribes during the time as well. Was there really any benefit for the indigenous people? signing Treaty 7, other than to, of course, get a bite to eat and... Well, if you look at the details of the treaties themselves, you know, uh, uh, the intent, you know, depending on how you read them, mm -hmm. the intent was to essentially turn uh, uh, the Aboriginal people into farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, some of the clauses are even in the treaties are even called the, the plows and cows clauses. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but the, the land that was often given to the indigenous people uh, wasn't suitable for farming. Of course. You know, there's reasons we now irrigate all of southern Alberta. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, you know, my own grandfather lost his homestead in 1824 in southern yeah. Alberta because of droughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. There were also provisions in the treaty for schooling. Um, the government was going to provide um, teachers on the reserves. They were going to provide food, blankets, those sorts of things. And so. Um, the Blackfoot people really were desperate. I think um, there's reports, and whether they're true or not, of discussions Crowfoot had with other leaders at the time saying, and they're saying, don't sign the treaty, it's not going to be good for the Blackfoot people. Mm -hmm. But essentially they were in such dire straits that they had to sign something. Um, there's also reports that Crowfoot wasn't happy with the results of the treaty, um, but neither were people like James McLeod. He really advocated for getting a good deal for the Blackfoot, and he wasn't he wasn't happy with the result of the treaty. He, this is he knew it had to be signed. But so th this yeah. is a man who uh, was revered uh, mm -hmm. amongst uh, settlers, like, you know, obviously the Northwest Mounted mm -hmm. Police and the indigenous people mm -hmm. alike. Mm -hmm. uh, a bit about his story. Uh, yeah. What kind of happened with, with James McLeod? Because he's a fascinating individual. Yeah, yeah. He, well, he is. He is. Um, I mean, Fort McLeod is named after him. He's got his name is sort of all over the landscape of McLeod Alberta. Trail. Yeah, right, McLeod right. Trail. Right. I mean, so he's sure, everywhere. Sure. He was, yeah, so he was quite high up in the Northwest Mounted Police, and he was a real, um, I mean, he, I think he must have just loved the West, and I think he wanted, he wanted to see good come of what was happening, and he, he worked quite hard, um, he worked quite hard with the Blackfoot and with other Aboriginal peoples to come up with a solution that worked for everybody. Um, 
his actually one of the really interesting things about McLeod is that we can get a glimpse into his personal life because he wrote loads of personal letters and they're all available oh. on the Glenbow's website online and a lot is of people right? don't know that you can no. go and you can read all of his letters to his wife Mary he's writing back home from all over so he's traveling he's down in Montana in Fort Benton he's in Saskatchewan in Fort Walsh he's at Fort Calgary he's at Fort oh, McLeod that's incredible so a and real he's, he's writing and you can really read into them and we yeah. have some of the quotes at the exhibition where you can really read into them um, the compassion he feels for the people of the West, um, the settlers and the Blackfoot, um, and yeah. and also how he feels, I think, that his hands are a bit tied in some sure. situations. A little um, frustrated at times. Yeah, yeah. so they're, they're a really interesting record, and I would recommend anyone who's interested in sort of a personal view of mm -hmm. of the time of Confederation and the Northwest Mounted Police, they're, they're a really fascinating read. I'm going to take the time. Uh, yeah. This stuff is fascinating. I think uh, more Calgarians should too, frankly. And a lot yeah. of us don't know about our own history. Exactly, I, I know. Yeah, yeah, and they're all digitized, they're all online, and it's such a fantastic resource. People should actually take time to read the treaties too and kind of understand that, you know, it isn't just, for example, the Blackfoot pe people that are treaty people. The three of us are treaty people mm -hmm. living in this area. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we have, we have responsibilities, but uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the thing, you know, the treaties perhaps were written with good intent. What followed the treaties was the thing actually that I find uh, wasn't written so good with intent. You had to find a way to now administer these treaties. Right. And that took the form of the Indian Act. And if you, if you really want to have some interesting reading and uh, wow. uh, it, read through so the Indian Act with, which exists today. It, uh, a lot of people it, say that was you know, maybe one of our darkest hours. Uh, well, it, uh, it, it ranked right amongst them. Yeah, but yeah certainly. The, uh, the, you know, I've always tried to get into the heads of some of the people that were writing some of this legislation. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think most people intentionally want to do wrong things. But there was, if you even just read it, the uh, Indian Act, and it, it, it talks about the, uh, the, the Queen's Indian subjects. She has, you know, has her white subjects and mm -hmm. her Indian subjects. Mm -hmm. And it, it talks about them in two different lights. And the intent was to protect them from people like the whiskey traders and the the uh, but it 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 it, it didn't work no. you, know, you can't turn little you know by residential schools no. for example you know that, those are things that came out of, of the course, Indian Act and, uh, of course you know and we're everyone's living with that legacy to that's this right. day that's right and it uh, it is just that it's a, it's a part of our legacy it's part of our legacy not just theirs let's talk a bit about uh, so let's fast forward a bit uh, mm -hmm. So late 1800s, I guess, you know, 1890-ish, you're living in Calgary. Uh, mm -hmm. what, well, of course, we haven't been incorporated as a city yet, though. Was, I think no. it was, was it not 1894? It's 1894. We, incorporated? we are incorporated okay. as a town in 1884, and then town, 10 years okay. later, we become a city. City of Calgary. Yeah. Okay, okay, 1894. We've got yeah. 3,900 residents. Is that about right? <laughs> yeah. In Calgary. What's yeah, life like? I mean, uh, what, what are the hardships that people are facing, our earliest citizens? Well, <coughs> other than, of course, other than the, the winter. Other than the Lougheeds? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> you know, 1891, Lougheed, the Lougheeds built their wonderful Lougheed house. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it had all the modern conveniences. Uh, we don't know for sure how much it cost at the time to build. Yeah. Pretty it petty, was a lot. Sure, yeah. But the, the Lougheeds had made their fortune in uh, commercial real estate development. Uh, yeah. James Lougheed was also a wonderful lawyer, very well respected, mm -hmm. and in fact got appointed to the Canadian Senate. Uh, it's interesting story. His, his uncle Richard, actually Bell's uncle Richard Hardesty mm -hmm. had been imported to the Senate in 1888 but was killed, uh, thrown from his buggy in a horse and buggy and, and was killed and mm -hmm. Sir John A. Macdonald was looking for a replacement out in you know the, the Western Territories sure, here sure. and there weren't many uh, people and, the, and uh, young James. Well and I, maybe not many people that met McDonald's criteria. That's right. As I'm sure. And James had worked on Sir John A. McDonald's uh, election campaign back in the late 1870s in Toronto. So, okay. and, and it was kind of a natural fit, but at age 35, young lawyer Lots James Lougheed yeah. became Senator James Lougheed, yeah, and he that. served 36 years That's incredible. as a senator until so, but, he okay, died. Okay, yeah. so things were, you know, relatively yeah. speaking, probably a bit easier for for Mr. Lawton than the, the average yeah. Calgarian. I mean, what, what sort there, of hardships? There was, there was electricity. Okay. Uh, the, you know, Peter, okay. Peter Prince, the Eau Claire Lumber Company, uh, also developed, uh, the owners of it, Peter Prince, developed the, uh, the uh, uh, a, a power company that sold power to, to Calgary. Uh, and it, uh, you know, Calgary had power 
by the late 1880s. By the time the Lougheed's house was built, it, it had electricity. You just no, schooled me because I had no idea that we had electricity <laughs> that <laughs> early. Natural yeah. gas was brought into Calgary. Uh, the first natural gas actually came in 1910, okay. and it was to fuel the uh, the Calgary brewery. But a year later, what a great cost! Yeah, yeah well, nice. I, I, I support that fully. But uh, natural <laughs> gas was brought in. A pipeline was run from uh, the Bow Island area, where it was discovered by the railroad when they're actually drilling for water, preceding the railway coming out. So, okay. a number of years later, when eventually Lethbridge and Calgary got large enough, yeah. they brought natural gas in. So, you know, Calgary had natural gas. So, you know, life was life was life pretty wasn't good. that bad. It you sounds know, like I mean, you know, you know it wasn't you know, as bad it as was, we maybe painted our heads. A bit of a building boom going on through the uh, you know the 1890s, 1910s, mm -hmm. up to the First World War, yeah. and the First World War changed everything a bit. Uh, sure. Now, sure. Southern Alberta continued to have a pretty robust economy, but uh, uh, just because the price of wheat skyrocketed because the uh, the French and the Germans and everyone else in Europe were, weren't farming, they were fighting. Right, right. At the end of the First World War, the, the price of wheat dropped to less, you know, from $2.50 a bushel. Boom, bust, less, like another commodity than, that we deal with that. We've been doing this yeah. boom, yeah, but that's certainly. part of what yeah. I like to talk to Fair people right. about. And that, you know, the Lougheed house was built during the boom, right. but uh, there was a bust later. In fact, they it's lost all, their house It's later. all cyclical, it all yeah. comes around. Yeah. Uh, the Great Fire, there was a, well, I don't know, Great Fire. There was a fire in 1886, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, and things changed after that fire. Tell me a little yeah. bit about that, Caroline. Well, I mean, that's the reason that a lot of the buildings in Calgary are built of sandstone. sandstone. So right. Calgary used to be um, built um, of mostly wood, um, and there was a great fire, like you said, in 1886. Yeah. Um, fortunately, nobody died in it, right. but as a result, the city actually put a bylaw in place saying, well, town at that time put a bylaw in place saying any building over a certain size had to be built of sandstone. Right. And there were sandstone quarries all over the city. Um, there was a big one out um, at what is kind of near COP now, um, past Kapu. Um, and so that's why you see all the schools, lots of churches, and big mansions like Lougheed House were built of sandstone. Beautiful buildings. Historically yeah. Sandstone. Yeah, just to prevent, yeah. I mean, a fire ripping through a bunch of um, wooden structures in that day and age would have just kind of taken out an entire block. So mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. a really great safety measure. It's and, and that's part of the reason that Lougheed House exists today. It probably wouldn't still be standing no, um, if it wasn't built of sandstone. Not, right? the, the, other, you know, the other reason I think Lougheed House probably exists. Uh, you know, it, it uh, went through a couple of changes in history. When the, the, the last major users of it were the Canadian Red Cross. Mm -hmm. oh, they used so? it from 1947 to 1979. Wow. And I recall myself even in 1975 in what is now our mission room, uh, laying on a bed donating blood. Yeah. Is that so? Yeah. yeah. And some That's of the other right. guests we've had have shared the same yeah. They have yeah. to be guests that are closer to yeah. my age than your age. But yeah. And yeah. They, they eventually just outgrew the space. I mean, I think they liked the space, they, um, but they eventually outgrew it and then did a bit of a swap um, with the province. And so the province now owns Lougheed House and Red Cross was given a bigger, better, newer okay. building. Yeah, cool. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I want to talk a little bit about the railroad. Yeah, uh, the railroad, that's of course, the you know, like we talked about earlier, the, the treaty sort of made made way for the railroad to make its way to Calgary. Yeah. Uh, is this yeah. really kind of the defining moment for, for Calgary that really put us yeah. on the map as far a as commerce? 1883. 1883. Yeah. 1883. Yeah. It's um, yeah, it's the. I mean, the CPR for all of the West, not just for Calgary, is yeah. what it opened it up to settlers. Um, like Bill was saying about Treaty 7 and all of the treaties, that was necessary, that the treaties were signed, that the CPR could come through, that everything could kind of start. Mm -hmm. um, Crowfoot himself, for his sort of involvement in that, was actually given a lifetime pass on the CPR, so he could ride the CPR anywhere, anytime he wanted. Cool. Um, and so, yeah, so when the CPR arrived here, 1883, it, it actually is really interesting. A bunch of tents and kind of shantytown kind of buildings had been built in Inglewood um, on the other side of the river. They yeah, kind of that's, in Inglewood, sure. that's where the original kind that's of where the Calgary fort was. was. Yeah, the fort, was. The fort was right yeah. across the river, but on the other side was kind of where everyone was putting up their tents and their little houses. Um, but then when the CPR came, of course, they built their station um, where it is now on the other side of the river on what's now 9th Ave. And there's reports that almost overnight all of the tents and buildings picked up crossed the river and went to now where downtown wow. Calgary and that's is today. The, the building blocks where so, we are today essentially. Yeah, it's like so where the CPR <laughs> went is where it was. <laughs> we're, well, clearly we're out of time. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you both very much for yeah, being no here. Problem. Really really enjoyed enjoyed yeah, no problem. Thanks Bill, good to meet you. Thanks again, Carolyn. Thanks. Great job. Thanks, Thanks so much. Folks, uh, we're out of time as the music alluded to for a <laughs> moment or two there. Uh, as per usual, you can get at us. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, Instagram. Don't be a stranger. Until next time, take care.